So we are in chapter 12. We started this chapter on Tuesday and we're looking at the brain um, and the brain's function in the nervous system. We talked a little bit about the primary somatosensory cortex and the primary motor cortex found in the precentral and postcentral gyrus. And we're going to kind of move on now. So we are in part A of this four part PowerPoint um, for chapter 12. You guys aren't responsible for knowing everything. Um, so pay attention to the lecture and anything that I skip over. Uh, don't worry about uh, those parts. So let me highlight this here. So we're going to talk kind of about some of the association areas within the brain. Um, we'll first talk about where the visual areas are. Um, so we're going to focus on knowing, and I want you guys to know well, what each kind of lobe of the brain is responsible for and where these different association areas are and what they're responsible for. Uh, so the primary visual cortex is located on the extreme posterior tip of the occipital lobe and the visual association center will surround the primary visual cortex. It will use past visual experiments to interpret visual stimuli, like the color, the form, or movement. And this is where um, the ability to recognize faces comes into play. It's a complex processing which involves the entire posterior half of the cerebral hemispheres. So vision in visual areas will be focused on the occipital lobe, um, and there will be a vis visual association area surrounding, surrounding that cortex um, that has to do with the ability to recognize faces. Then the primary auditory co cortex and its association area uh, will be the superior margin of your temporal lobes. And remember the temporal lobe is the lobe of the cerebrum um, kind of beneath the temporal bone, so surrounding your ear area. Uh, the auditory areas will interpret information from the inner ear as pitch, loudness, and where it's located. And then the auditory association area is located posterior to the primary audi auditory cortex. And this will store memories of sounds and permits perception of sound stimulus. Uh, the vestibular cortex is the posterior part of the insula. Remember the insula was that kind of inner lobe of the brain that you can only see when you pull back the temporal lobe. And this will be responsible for conscious awareness of balance. So where your head is in space and having to do with balance. Your olfactory cortex, olfactory has to do with smell. Uh, the primary olfactory cortex is the medial aspect of your temporal lobes. So um, if you were to look kind of at the inside part of your temporal lobes, you'd find your olfactory cortex. Um, it will be along the olfactory bulbs and tracks coming from your olfactory nerve. That's cranial nerve um, number two or one. Now I can't remember. Oh, um, and this, the primary olfactory cortex is involved in the conscious, conscious awareness of odors. The gustatory cortex has to do with taste, and this is in the insula lobe, just deep to your temporal lobe. It's involved in the perception of taste. And the visceral sensory area, um, which will detect sensations from your visceral organs interiorly. Uh, this has the conscious perception of vis visceral sensations, such as an upset stomach or a full bladder. So this is just a review and kind of all that I want you to know is just where these sensory areas and related association areas are located and what they're useful for. And normally the name tells you what it's important for, um, but that's really kind of all that I want you to know about those um, kind of sensation areas and their association areas. This just shows you a medial view, a sagittal view of the brain if we separate it in half. Uh, to show a little more detail where the olfactory cortex is located. Remember, it's located kind of on the medial or inner lobe of that temporal lobe. Um, a little bit of clin clinical aspects, and then we might go on to part B. Um, damage to the primary visual cortex will result in functional blindness. And by contrast, individuals with a damaged visual association area, they'll be able to see, but they're not able to comprehend what they're looking at. Um, so it would maybe be like, oh, really anything, looking um, at a street sign, but not understand why it's important if it's the street you live on or something like that. Okay, um, now I'm just going to skip ahead here, and I think 
we're going to move on to um, we'll talk about this clinical imbalance and then we're going to move on to part B um, because the clinical and the clinical information I think at least keeps you interested a little bit um, homeostatic imbalance um, oops this isn't what I wanted here, mental and personality disorders. These are tumors or other lesions of the anterior association area. Um, so in the anterior side of the brain, this may cause mental personality disorders, including loss of judgment, attentiveness, and other inhibitions. Um, so individuals with a tumor in this area of the brain may be oblivious to social restraints, uh, perhaps becoming careless about social or personal appearances and take more risks. Um, so if you notice a friend or a family member who's not quite acting how they normally would, um, they might want to get uh, their brain checked out. So keep that in mind. So let's go ahead on to part um, B here. And I'm just going to go ahead and exit out of these. Okay. I think this is part C. So... Let, sorry guys, I'm just pulling up. Do you guys see the diencephalon in front of you? Simple yes. yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so we're in part B now. And the first parts of part B describe some of the anatomy of the brain, but we're gonna focus on the diencephalon part of the brain, which has to do with your thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. And these three structures are incredible incredibly important with the nervous system because your thalamus will be kind of the reception of all sensory stimuli. So all sensory information will go to your thalamus and the thalamus is the structure in your brain that processes it and tells it where to go to each part of the brain. The hypothalamus is located directly low, below the thalamus and the hypothalamus has to do with controlling um, hormone secretion. Uh, the epithalamus will be a part above the thalamus, and all three of these structures, um, they're called the gray matter structures because they're made of in, mostly entirely of the gray matter. They will all enclose the third ventricle. So this is an animation showing the anatomy of a rotatable brain. Um, so you can download this animation and watch it. It'll be a great review of anatomy. Um, and this is just a look, let's focus on the diencephalon. Um, so here's your thalamus. It will enclose the third ventricle. So it's this area um, right here where my cursor is. There's a little kind of bullseye in the middle of it, and that's just an interthalamic adhesion. So it would be a mass of the thalamus that keeps the two kind of halves of the thalamus connected. Uh, right below the thalamus, we have a hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus um, is what will release different releasing factors, a part of your endocrine system, to control hormones that are released from your pituitary gland. Um, so again, these three parts make up the diencephalon, the gray matter masses of the brain. And then the epithalamus uh, is made up of the pineal gland and the posterior commissure, and it'll be located kind of right here. So not really on top of the epi, but more posterior to the thalamus. So these are three parts of the diencephalon. You can see them here on kind of a cadaver view of the brain. So the thalamus, it's a bilateral egg-shaped nuclei. Um, and it forms kind of the upper and lateral walls of your third ventricle. It makes up the majority of what we call the diencephalon part of the brain. Um, and it's connected by this interthalamic adhesion. Um, so here's a look at your th um, thalamus. Is that it has different, what we call nuclei, a part of it. And these nuclei are just important for receiving different sensations from all parts of the body and then projecting that to the appropriate area of the brain where it's supposed to go to. Um, so we call the thalamus kind of the um, kind of the catch-all of all your sensory information, and it will dictate which part of the brain that that sensory information goes to. All right, so the main function of your thalamus is to act as a relay station. Um, for all information coming into the cortex, it'll sort, edit, and relay all ascending input. Um, ascending input, that means it's coming up through the spinal cord. Um, so, such as impulses from your hypothalamus for get regulating emotion and visceral or organ function, 
impulses from your cerebellum and basal nuclei to help direct motor cortices or motor movement. And impulses for um, memory or sens sens sensory integration. So in general, overall, it acts to mediate sensation, motor activities, cortical arousal, learning, and memory. And that's just kind of the big picture I want you to know about the thalamus. It's kind of the catch-all relay station uh, for all sort of ascending input that's coming to the brain. The hypothalamus is located below the thalamus. Um, it forms a cap over the brain stem. It contains other many important nuclei. Um, the mammillary bodies, we can see them on the brain in anatomy of the brain, and those will act alpha as olfactory relay stations. And then connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland is a stalk or a piece of brain tissue, kind of like a branch called the infundibulum. And this just connects the hypothalamus to your pituitary gland. Um, so here is the hypothalamus made up of more nuclei. Um, and think of these individual nuclei as just its own kind of center for directing traffic and where it's going to spit out information. Here's the infundibulum that will connect the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Um, and that's just important, again, for hormone regulation because your hypothalamus will send out releasing factors that will travel to your pituitary gland. And then your pituitary gland will send out specific hormones uh, to different parts of the body. Uh, so here's the hypothalamus, its functions. It controls your autonomic nervous system, like your blood pressure, your rate and force of your heartbeat, digestive tract motility, and pupil size. Uh, so again, remember your autonomic nervous system, we can divide into the parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. It will also, sorry, initiate physical responses to emotions. And th this is how it gets part of your limbic system. Um, which is all of your pleasure system, fear, rage, sex drive, biological rhythms. Um, the hypothalamus will also initiate those physical responses. Uh, more functions of your hypothalamus, um, regulating body temperature, regulating hunger, regulating water balance and thirst, regulating your sleep and awake cycles. Um, so lots of functions of the hypothalamus. And then this is the big one that I talked about, how it controls your endocrine system functions, such as secretions of the anterior pituitary gland and the production of your posterior pituitary hormones. And we'll get into a lot of that when we talk about the endocrine system. But again, big, big picture, just understanding um, the general functions of the hypothalamus. Uh, that's what I, what I would like you guys to know. Um, some clinical aspects to any sort of hypothalamic disturbance or disorder that'll disrupt your hypothalamic functions. Um, it would cause severe body wasting, um, so your body muscles will waste away. Uh, obesity, um, if you're not able to control um, the idea of feeling full. Sleep disturbances, it controls your sleep-wake cycle. Dehydration. It controls the ability um, to tell if you're thirsty or not and any sort of emotional imbalance. Um, so you can have a tumor in your hypothalamic region. Um, it could also be damaged by other radiation, um, by surgery or any sort of other trauma. So it's just amazing to me how we know what different parts of the brain do. So if someone is complaining of a problem, um, a brain surgeon or someone very knowledgeable about the nervous system in the brain would be able to maybe dictate where in the brain um, they're having that issue even before they take a scan. And then the epithalamus, this is the last part, the third part of what we call the diencephalon. It forms the roof of the third ventricle. Um, the big one here is that it contains the pineal gland or the pineal body. And the pineal gland and body are important to know in that it secretes melatonin that regulates your sleep-wake cycle. So you hear a lot about melatonin and the pineal gland is responsible for secreting that. Okay, so this is just a review again of the diencephalon, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Um, those were the parts that I wanted you to know about that. Um, and we're going to skip ahead now to the midbrain because uh, the midbrain will have these pieces shown here. And let me just skip ahead 
Oh, guys, there's so much we could talk about here. I'm going to start. So the midbrain, um, but let's move on to the pons. And oh, yeah, how much do I want? How much do you guys want to learn? Let's start with what we're talking about here. Let's a picture. When I say midbrain, what am I talking about? So we talked about the diencephalon. And now we're going to talk about the brain stem. So the brain stem is made up of the midbrain, this area, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So these are three parts of the brain stem, and they'll be basically the top part of your spinal cord. So your spinal cord will then exit the brain, but the midbrain, pons, and the medulla oblongata are the three pieces above the spinal cord. So the midbrain is located right underneath the diencephalon, the thalamus, and the and located above the pons. Um, it has cerebral peduncles, which are two ventral bulges that contain motor tracts. And when we talk about a tract, whether it's a sensory or a motor tract, that just refers to a passageway of nerves, whether they're motor or sensory, into or out of the brain. Uh, these cerebral peduncles will form kind of like pillars that will hold up the cerebrum. And the cerebral aqueduct is a channel that runs through the midbrain. Remember from anatomy, that cerebral aqueduct will connect your third and fourth ventricles together. Um, there's different gray matter in here. You'll have um, cranial nerves that come off of this area. But let's just look. Here is uh, the diencephalon. And maybe if we look here, anything below the diencephalon will be the midbrain. And the midbrain will be all these structures. Um, it's called the corpora quagemina of the tectus. And then we get the uh, peduncles, which are kind of the pillars that hold up the cerebrum of the brainstem. And then the pons will come right below the midbrain. And then the medulla oblongata will come out below that. Um, so maybe we'll kind of skip ahead now to the pons and the medulla oblongata. Um, for this, I, I'd really just want you guys to kind of understand the anatomy behind this understand that the thalamus, we're talking about the diencephalon, the midbrain has structures that hold up the cerebrum, and then we're getting to the pons and the medulla oblongata, and these are the three parts of the brainstem. Um, okay, there's different visual and auditory reflex and relay centers in parts of the midbrain. Um, specifically, the substantia nigra or nigra is functionally linked to basal nuclei in the midbrain, and that's where uh, Parkinson's disease, the degeneration of this area is associated with Parkinson's disease. So there is a clinical aspect for you there. Um, so let's go ahead on to, this shows you cross sections of the midbrain. Um, the pons then is located between your midbrain and the medulla oblongata. Um, the fourth ventricle will separate the pons from the cerebellum. So um, the pons is directly in front of the cerebellum, anterior to that, with the fourth ventricle in between the two. It's composed of conduction tracts, uh, longitudinal fibers that are connecting higher brain centers and the spinal cord. So running through the pons, we have these tracts of nerves uh, that will just connect higher brain centers in your cerebrum with your spinal cord. There are also transversal or dorsal fibers that relay impulses between the motor cortex and the cerebellum. And again, the cerebellum is the part of the brain that lies in the back posterior cavity. Here are cranial nerves that come off of the pons. Don't worry about knowing which cranial nerves come off of which structure. Um, some nuclei in the pons play a role um, in the reticular formation of the brain, and also some help maintain normal rhythm of breathing. So here's just a cross-section of the pons showing where some cranial nerves are coming out. For example, the trigeminal nerve. Um, here are fibers of the pyramidal tract. That's a specific name for a tract of nerves running up to the cerebrum. And here's the fourth ventricle behind the pons. Um, then we get to the medulla oblongata, which is the third and final part of the brainstem. And again, we're working our way from top to bottom. We're in um, the brainstem area, and this is the third and final part. We're in the medulla oblongata. It will blend into the spinal cord at the foramen magnum. What's the foramen magnum? Does anyone remember? Take a break there and see if anyone's listening. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's the big hole in the bottom of the, the skull. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Erin. So the frame and magnum is the big hole at the base of the skull. So right at that kind of location will change over from the medulla to the spinal cord. Your medulla oblongata also contains the fourth ventricle and it will also contain the choroid plexus. This is something important to know that choroid plexus is responsible for forming all cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so the choroid plexus is in the medulla oblongata. Um, some structures of the medulla, uh, medulla oblongata, there are pyramids, um, which are ridges formed by pyramidal tracts from the motor cortex area of the brain. Uh, desiccation of the pyramids is the point where these pyramidal tracts cross over to opposite sides of the body. Um, the word desiccation means crossing over. And many times, not always, but any sort of sensory impulse that comes from the right side of the body will desiccate in these pyramids of the medulla oblongata and will go up to the left side of the brain. Um, not always, but many times the right side of the body sensations will desiccate, cross over in the medulla and go up to the left side of the brain. So whenever you see the word desiccation, that just means crossing over. Um, and many times this occurs in the medulla oblongata. Um, olives, don't worry about those. Cranial nerves, um, eight, nine, 10, and 12 come out of the medulla oblongata. And I think that's all we're gonna talk about there. And again, we're just gonna review here the diencephalon, thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, then we get to your midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Um, with that, I think that's pretty good. Um, thanks for bearing with me here. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything before I move on to something else. Um, okay. Then we'll get to the cere cerebellum. Any questions so far? I know we're jumping all over the place, and I apologize. Um, but I'm kind of picking and choosing what I want to talk about. Okay. All right, we're gonna end here this part with the cerebellum and um, we'll talk a little bit about why the cerebellum is important and then we'll be done with this part. For lab exam, do we need to know location and function? Um, so your lab exams will only be based on the labs that you're doing, um, such as the information from the labsters and that PhysioX lab. So I'll try to keep um, the lab exam only based on information found in labster. And it won't be a lot of anatomical structures unless it was found in a labster. Does that help answer your question, Erin? If we were in anatomy, it would be different probably. Um, okay. Some cerebellar anatomy. Um, so this is your cerebellum. Um, it has this arbor vitae, which looks like it's areas of white matter within the gray cerebellum, gray matter, and it looks like branches from a tree. So that's what the arbor vitae is. And the cerebellum, again, sits right behind the pons, and the fourth ventricle um, separates the pons from the cerebellum. Uh, remember, the fourth ventricle is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the cerebral spinal fluid continues out of the fourth ventricle down the central canal of the spinal cord. So all of your cerebral spinal fluid will be connected uh, within these ventricles. So here is the cerebellum, and here's another look at the cerebellum. Um, and with the arbor vitae, and the arbor vitae are just the areas of white matter in white, surrounded by the areas of gray matter. And again, areas of white matter just have to do with myelination of axons. And the gray matter is less myelination um, and some dendrites and cell bodies. Another look at the cerebellum. Kind of looks like spaghetti, but maybe I shouldn't say that because you guys <laughs> would never eat spaghetti again. Um, Three paired of fiber tracks will connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. So the cerebellum is connected to the brainstem by these three different tracks. So just understand that the cerebellum, um, all fibers in the cerebellum are ipsilateral. That means from and to the same side of the body. 
So unlike the brain that usually controls opposite sides of the body, and when I say brain, I mean the cerebrum, the cerebellum, um, all the fibers and tracks going to and from the cerebellum are ipsilateral, meaning they're from and to the same side of the body. Uh, there's three pairs of fiber tracks that connect the cerebellum to the brain stem. Um, and cerebellum processing, the cerebellum itself fine tunes motor activity as follows. So this is where you'll wanna just take note about what the functions of the cerebellum are and what exactly it does. It will receive impulses from your cerebral cortex, which is your cerebrum, of intent to initiate voluntary muscle contraction. It will receive signals from proprioceptors throughout the body. And again, proprioception is the ability of the body to tell where it is in relation to other body parts. So you'll have proprioceptors in joints, in your bones, in your muscles. Um, so your knee always knows where it's located in relation to your leg or your arm, if that makes sense. So that's proprioception. Um, so these pathways continually inform the cerebellum of the body's position and momentum. The cerebral cortex calculates the best way to smoothly coordinate muscle contraction uh, so that everything happens naturally at the same time. Think of walking, running. Um, it'll also send a blueprint of this coordinated movement to the cerebral motor cortex and the brainstem nuclei. Um, so basically, simply put, your cerebellum takes care of all motor activity, but it fine tunes it um, in terms of body position, momentum, and to make sure everything comes together smoothly as one. Uh, cognitive functions, if we take a neuro image of the cerebellum, we can see that the cere cerebellum also plays a role in thinking, language, emotion. As it does for motor processes, it may compare actual output of higher functions with the expected output and adjust accordingly. So kind of think of your cerebellum as the brain's brain. It kind of takes what the brain tells it to do and it adjusts it so that everything um, happens as it should. So here's the cerebellum, different lobes to it. Um, and it shows kind of how, where, which of the lobes control different parts of the body. So this is another um, character, caricature drawing, a homunculus of what parts of the brain that it will control in terms of motor unit, motor movement. Phew, how are you guys doing so far? I'm trying to keep it not too dry. Doing okay. Okay. Um, all right. I, um, I, we're going to talk a little bit about memory and higher mental functions, and then uh, we're going to be done. Um, and thanks for your um, patience here. So higher mental functions. So we'll take a look at the higher mental functions. And uh, maybe we'll just get through higher mental functions and we'll stop a little early. Um, and I think I won't ask you guys to know too much more from chapter 12. Because I think we're, this is, this will be plenty. We could probably have a whole test on chapter 12. Yikes. No one would probably want that. Okay. Um, higher mental functions. So I believe this is part C. So we're going to talk a little bit about language and memory. Um, brain waves, EEGs, which are electrograms that have to do with the brain itself, sleep and wait cycles, and consciousness. So language. Language implementation, the main areas of language implementation um, we're looking at the left hemisphere, the Broca's area, and the Wernicke's area. You might have heard these um, areas in anatomy a little bit. Um, the Broca's area is involved in speech production. Um, so patients with lesion, lesions in this area would understand words but could not speak. And the Wernicke's area is involved in understanding spoken and written words. So pa patients with lesions in the Wernicke's could speak, but the words would be nonsensible. Um, corresponding areas on the right side of the hemisphere are involved with nonverbal language components. 
Um, so the Wernicke's and Broca's association area, um, you can kind of see them in the dashed lines. So Wernicke's area is outlined here in the dashed lines area, and here's the Broca's area. Memory. So where does memory occur? Memory, memory is the storage and retrieval of information. A lot of people take our memory for granted, but we'll probably lose it one day, short, whether it's short term or long term. There's different kinds of memory. Um, declarative memory is the memory of facts. Procedural memory is the memory of skills. Motor memory is the memory of motor skills like riding a bike. And emotional memory is the memory of experiences linked to an emotion. Um, like heart pounding when you hear a rattlesnake. Um, don't worry about knowing the different kinds of memory. I just want to keep you guys aware of this. There's two stages of declarative memory storage. And again, declarative memory storage is all memory, the facts, names, faces, words, dates, um, what street you live on. Short-term memory, this is your working memory. This is temporary holding of information. Um, usually it's only limited to seven or eight pieces of information at a time. And your long-term memory has limitless capacity. Um, factors that affect the transfer from a short-term memory into a long-term memory could be an emotional state. Um, so you remember something best if you're alert, you're motivated, you're surprised, or you're aroused. And that makes sense. We all do better when we're alert or motivated. Uh, rehearsal, repetition, and practice. So what does this teach you about learning new information? Repeat it, practice it, write it down. Every time you write something down on a piece of paper, that's helping transfer something from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Association, tying new information with an old memory. So if you can attach a new memory with something that happened a long time ago in your past, that'll help for you to remember it. And automatic memory is just subconscious information stored in long-term memory. Um, in terms of consolidation, this is involves fitting new facts into categories already stored in your cerebral cortex. And these are the parts of the brain that are invo involved in, consol in consolidation. So here's just a look at how memories are processed, whether um, you, you see something, you have a pain, um, a sound memory or a nose memory. There will be temporary, temporary storage. Um, data will be selected for transfer into your short-term memory. You'll probably easily forget it and the data will be permanently lost or it can be transferred into long-term memory, um, usually influenced by how excited you are about it, rehearsal, repeating it, um, and associating that new short-term memory with long-term memory. All right, um, we'll talk a little bit about amnesia. Um, damage to the hippocampus or the surrounding temporal lobe on either side will result in only slight memory loss. Um, bilateral destruction causes widespread amnesia. Um, so amnesia just has to do with memory lost. Anterograde amnesia is when consolidated memories are not lost, but new inputs are not associated with old ones. So a person will just live in the here and now, and memory of conversations from just five minutes before uh, would not be remembered. Whereas retrograde amnesia um, is loss of memories formed in the distant past. All right, um, brain waves reflect the electro electrical activity of higher mental functions. Normal brain functions are continuous and hard to measure. Um, an electroencephalogram, so encephalo has to do with the brain, and this will be an electrical um, kind of vi visual display of the electrical activity of brain function. This can, these can be used for diagnosing epilepsy, sleep disorders. It can locally, loc locate any uh, tumors, infections, abscesses, any sort of lesion in the brain. Um, it can be help to determine brain death, so if parts of the brain are dying off. Um, to do this, you'll place electrodes on the scalp, which will measure electrical potential differences between different cortical areas. So here's a look at an EEG and brain waves um, where scalp electrodes are used to record brain wave activity. Um, so from that, there's different peaks and frequencies that you can get from the EEG. Um, the delta waves, beta waves, and theta waves 
um, are all these frequencies and height of the frequencies will all determine um, different kind of associations. So whether you're in deep sleep, you'll show a lot of delta waves. Um, theta waves are common in children. Beta waves are awake and alert. Alpha waves are awake but relaxed. So a little bit about seizures and a little more clinical aspects. And then I think um, we'll end with consciousness for tonight. And maybe sleep-wake cycles if you guys are still with me. So a seizure, an epile epileptic seizure, it's a torrent of electrical discharges by groups of neuro neurons. So kind of an influx of electrical discharges by neurons. Um, a victim of these seizures of epilepsy may lose complete consciousness. They might fall stiffly, have uncontrollable jerking. Um, epilepsy is not associated with any intellectual impairments, but it does occur in about 1% of the population. Um, genetics could play a role, but also any sort of brain injury, stroke, infections, or tumors could also be the cause. This kind of takes you through um, this the seizures, you guys can read through that if you're curious about it, but I won't ask you any more about epilepsy and seizures. Uh, consciousness. Consciousness involves perception of sensation, the voluntary initiation and control of movement. So if we say you have conscious, conscious control of your body, you're usually associating that with voluntary motor control of your skeletal muscles. Um, capabilities of consciousness also are so associated with higher mental processing, like memory, logic, judgment. Um, and it's clinically defined on a continuum that will grade the behavior in response to any sort of stimuli like alertness, drowsiness, stupor, or a coma. Uh, fainting. Except during sleep, loss of consciousness will signal that brain function is impaired. Um, fainting is just a brief loss of that conscious state, and it's often due to inadequate cerebral blood flow. Um, so if you lose a lot of blood, you could faint because you're getting inadequate blood flow up to the brain. Um, so that could be due to a hemorrhage or a sudden severe emotional stress as well. A coma is an unconsciousness for extended period. Um, it's not the same as deep sleep. Oxygen consumption will be lowered during a coma. And then what we talk about brain death is an irreversible coma. Um, this is the brain death is the ethical and legal issues surround decisions on whether the person is dead or alive, but usually brain death occurs when there are no more electrical activity that can be perceived in the brain. Um, and that again can be found out when you take an EEG of the person um, to me measure their EEG waves. Um, okay. So I think the sleep and wake cycles, I think we're going to start here next time. And um, I think we'll finish with that tonight. I know this chapter, I tried to only focus on the things that were um, interesting. We're not going to spend a whole lot more time on chapter 12. Um, but let me go ahead and stop the recording and then I will answer.